information. Matt Stein is the author of the highly praised book, When Technology Fails, a comprehensive manual on sustainable living skills, survival, and disaster prepared, uh, preparations. Here's my dog-eared copy of it. He's used that <laughs> book. <laughs> That's a book you used. Yeah, it is a book. I, uh, there's too much in there. I can't remember it all. i got to look up stuff myself. Matt's a graduate of MIT where he uh, majored in mechanical engineering. He is an engineer and a licensed contractor as the owner of Stein Design and Construction. He has built hurricane resistant, energy efficient, and environmentally friendly homes. The mechanical engineering side of his firm specializes in product design and development. Among other things, Matt has designed consumer water filtration devices, solar uh, PV roofing panels, uh, medical bacteriological filters, emergency chemical drench systems, computer disk drives, of course when technology fails, we need all that stuff, right. uh, and portable fiberglass buildings. My goodness, you are talented. Don't I just, talented. And occasionally a little bit of automation, but this guy over here is the real automation expert. So. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've teamed up on some projects. So, here to give us our uh, keynote address for the Green Living Festival uh, on peak oil prep and making the shift to sustainability, please help me welcome Mr. Matt Stein. Okay. Thanks. First, I want to ask you a couple questions. Um, how many people here are real familiar with peak oil? Or just, just raise your hands if you're real familiar with it. How many aren't really sure what it means? Okay. Um, how many of you are interested, first we're going to go with, with big scale solutions, like how like you're worried about the future of the world and, you know, how are we going to change that course that we're on, you know, how, okay. Now how about small scale solutions like, okay, I know stuff's happening and changing in the world, how do I prepare myself to deal with it? So how many are interested in that? Okay. Okay. So, same, same things that bother me bother you. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, so the question is, you know, how bad is it really on the planet? And I'll say as an engineer and with a scientific background, degree from MIT, that there's currently six trends, major trends in the planet. And, you know, as an engineer, we all went, most of us went through school and we did graphs and algebra. And when you've got a, a graph, and it's headed towards the bottom, and then and that's a trend, then most of us know if we don't do something different that it's going to eventually hit the bottom. Now unfortunately right now we've got six major trends and each of those are potential civilization busters and so far we haven't actually done anything effectively to change that graph headed for the bottom on any one of the six trends. So the prognosis is that if we don't do anything different, I can guarantee you we're going to collapse civilization in the world as we know it. The big question in everybody's mind is how soon is that going to happen? Now, I'm hoping we can do something different. So it, the talk's not just all about bumming you out. Some of it's about where we're headed, what we can do individually, what we can do collectively to stop that. And because there's going to be some major bumps in the road, even if we do everything right, what can we do for our friends, our family, and ourselves to, you know, hopefully help us get through this period of time. It's, it's probably going to be pretty tough. Okay, so there's a perfect storm building of these six trends. Now, what are those trends? Now, 
These are the six worst ones. I'm going to go into each one. I don't have a ton of time today, so it's not like I can spend a lot of time on them. I'm going to finish the talk about quarter to one, and we'll have a few minutes for questions, and then after that, I'm going over to a table next to the information booth, and I'll be signing books. You can look at my book. You don't have to buy one. I've got all the first edition for like less than half price, and then the new edition, and you know, it's a good it's a good thing to have on hand. So anyway, I don't have a lot of time here, so if we have a lot of questions, feel free to come over, and we'll answer questions. I got plenty of time after the talk. So the six trends. One is climate change or global weirding. You know, uh, global weirding basically says that we're screwing up the natural systems of our world that stabilize, that give us nice stable weather that helps make planet Earth a good place for people to live. So it's not just global warming, we're also destabilizing these weather systems. Number two is peak oil, and I'll be explaining that more carefully in a few minutes. I'll spend a lot of time on that one. And peak oil is basically saying that there's only so much oil in the world, and if it's being rebuilt under the, underneath the surface of the planet, it's at such a slow rate that we're using it a lot faster than it's rebuilding itself. So. Basically, we're running out of oil, and, and peak oil says not just that energy, it's not like one day there's lots of oil and the next day it's gone. It's that the oil gets harder and harder to get, and it means that at some point, every oil field reaches its peak and starts declining, and globally, the average of the, all the oil fields basically says right now we're at that peak. Okay. Number three, collapse of the world's oceans. The oceans are part, they help feed us, you know, we eat a lot of food out of the ocean. But more importantly than that, they're a major part of the carbon oxygen cycle that keeps like weather and a breathable atmosphere on the planet. So there's a lot more than just fish in the ocean that contributes to the stability of the planet and the livability of the planet. Number four is deforestation. And number five is the food crisis. And that's a combination of soil depletion, water issues and climate change. All of those together are building a food crisis. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these, but again, I can't spend a ton of time on them. And then the last one is the elephant in the closet that most people, and politicians in particular, are staying away from, and it's really the biggest one of them all, is population and overshoot. Okay. Now, I'm going to focus more on peak oil today than the other issues. Not that peak oil is any worse than the other issues, but that peak oil is, is currently hitting us hard right now. And it's going to, if we don't do something really significant, it's going to collapse our financial systems a lot worse than they've been collapsing recently. And so it's probably the one that's going to be most in our face most quickly. So that's the one I'm going to spend more time on than the rest. Doesn't mean it's worse. It's just most in our face most quickly. OK, weather changing. 10 warmest years on record since 1990. This year is on track. It's been unusually cool in California this year and along the coast. But over the planet in general, it's on track to be the record-breaking year. If, if not the hottest year on record, then second hottest year on record. And it's probably going to be the hottest year on record. But again, weather is one of those funny things where you can't draw a conclusion just because locally. Like last winter, it was, oh, it's you know a killer winter in the East Coast and lots of snow. So that means global warming is a farce. Wrong. It was still one of the warmest winters on record globally, but in the northern latitudes, in the center part of the northern hemisphere, it was <coughs> back the way it used to be. And there's some good reasons for it, and, I'm, and later on I'll be glad to tell you if you want to know it, but there's actually a lot of science behind why it was kind of normal in the northern hemisphere last year. But globally it was still very warm. Now, here's something that's kind of scary. We've been burning fossil fuels, which means coal, gas, diesel, you know, those kinds of things, for several centuries. But over half of what we burned and put in the atmosphere has happened since 1980. So here we got like 600 years of burning coal and stuff, but over half of what we did has been in the last 30 years. Okay? Greenhouse gases now, what greenhouse gases is, is when you burn certain things, and some certain gases, when they go in the atmosphere, they act like the glass in a greenhouse, and they help to hold heat into the planet. And the major greenhouse gas that people talk about is carbon dioxide from burning wood, burning coal, burning oil. 
but the other greenhouse gases collectively equal about the same effect as burning wood, you know, as CO2. And those are things like methane, um, CFCs, you know, the whole variety of things, water moisture, they all collectively add up to about the same as CO2. So years ago, when some scientists who've been chided in, in, uh, in the news because they said, well, first you're predicting global cooling and now you're predicting global warming. And it's like, well, science is not perfect. You know, I'm not born knowing everything. So years ago, they thought that there was a cooling effect from aerosols, which, is, which happens, you know, when you burn stuff and soot goes up in the air, it cools the planet. But then there, and then there was also a heating effect from greenhouse gases. Well, it turned out that the cooling effect was settled out faster than expected, so it was a quarter what they thought. And the heating effect, they, they neglected all these things outside of CO2. So the heating effect was twice what they thought, and the cooling effect was a quarter of what they thought. So they changed their minds. And they changed it because good science said their first assumptions were wrong. And that's what good science does. Now, MIT study says that climate change is accelerated. It could reach 6.3 degrees F. Well, you say, well, that doesn't sound that bad. You know, we'll get a little bit hotter, no big deal. But globally, what it means is that it's going to wipe out most of the crops and most of the bread baskets of the world, making it extremely difficult to feed our planet. OK, let's move on. There is a global climate conspiracy, I must admit. There is a climate conspiracy. And that conspiracy has been well documented. And it's on the part of the fossil fuel companies funding junk scientists to go around. So every time there's a report out about what the scientists are saying in terms of the planet is happening, then the well-funded conspiracy says, goes to the media and says, we need our alternate side of the opinion on there. And they get their junk scientists out there. So there is a, there is a global climate, climate conspiracy. OK, what's happening? Now, this gives you a good idea right here. Like, why is this happening? This is what we've been putting into the atmosphere in terms of greenhouse gases. And you can see how right here, since 1950, it really didn't start really ramping up till after the 50s. And it's really ramped up now. OK, peak oil. Well, peak oil, whenever you develop an oil field, you know, it takes about 10 years from the time they find the oil field and start planning on developing it until they actually start producing it. So all the oil we're pumping today is oil that was discovered 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Now, as you go in and develop a field, you put down some wells, you put down more wells, you start pumping like crazy. And eventually, it starts running dry. So then they start doing things called enhanced oil recovery. They start pumping lots of sea, sea water or fresh water or you know, air from the atmosphere, stuff and chemicals down into the oil wells to try and make them produce. So back in the 1950s, there was this guy named M. King Hubbard. Now, he was an oil company executive. And in those days, the United States was the number one oil exporter in the world. Now, it's hard to believe, but back in 1950, we, made, we pumped more and refined more oil and sold more oil around the world than anybody. So we were the Saudi Arabia of the world in 1950. Now, at that point, he predicted that in 18 years, that by the end of, by the, end of the 60s, that we would be, have peaked in production and we would be importing oil. Now, the people in the industry jumped all over this guy. They said, you've got to be crazy. You know, we're the number one producer and exporter of oil in the world. How could we, like 15 years from now, be, you know, how could that happen? Well, he was right. He was accurate to within one to two years in his prediction. Now, just as the United States peaked in its production and started to decline, the world is peaking in its production and starting to decline. So here, here we are, like right here. Now, there's kind of a plateau right now. Like, if you look at just regular crude oil, we actually peaked in 2005, 2006. If you add in the biofuels and the tar sands from Venezuela and the tar sands from Alberta, Canada, now we haven't quite peaked. We're kind of like creeping up slightly or kind of staying flat. But when you actually look at regular, easy to get crude oil, we're already past the peak in that. It's already done. Now, they wouldn't be drilling. 5,000 feet under the ocean and another 10,000 feet below that in the Gulf, in the deep oil. If it would, because it's a damn expensive to do that. They wouldn't be going after that oil 
if there was other easy to get to oil, it was prof much more profitable and much easier to get to. So they're going after the hard to get to stuff now, the tar sands, the biofuels, things that are very expensive to, to, to refine, to keep us going in oil. Now, look at this. This is, what, this is pretty amazing. Back here in the 1960s, the world oil discoveries maxed out. Now, I'll tell you as an engineer, the technology to discover oil was miles behind where it is now. I mean, they're so far ahead. Think about computers. Think about what happened. You know, a giant room full of equipment in the 1960s does less than that laptop does right there. Now, oil discovery technology has made similar strides. Look at how much oil they're discovering right now compared to they were discovering in the 60s. So any hopes of like some great new techno discovery of finding more oil, like, oh, there's all this oil and there's conspiracy in the world and they're just preventing us from finding the oil, that's a bunch of hogwash. Because there's a lot of money to be made on that oil. And if they had this kind of oil out there to find today, they would be finding it. But they're finding that kind of oil. That's what they're finding. Not this kind of oil, they're finding that kind of oil. Now look at how much we're using. We're using this much and we're finding this much. That's like going out and charging a hundred grand on your credit cards every year and, and, and paying off $25,000 on the credit cards. How long are you going to keep that up? Now unfortunately, if you look at all the other energy things, if you look at gas, if you look at oil, if you look at nuclear and you add them all together, well, the sum energy of all of them is peaking just you know, essentially right behind peak oil. So it's not like there's some other alternative fuel out there that we can mine out of the planet to get us out of this predicament. Okay, now, now you say, oh, I'm probably running out of time. We'll go off of that. But basically what, it's, what this is saying right here is that if we were to go out and discover and drill, 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 baby, drill, we would have to discover and develop an entire Saudi Arabia's worth of oil every few years from now till eternity. Ain't going to happen. Just, it, it, it's impossible to drill, baby, drill and get us out of this situation. Now, why do we care? 5% drop in global oil production in the 1970s. Arab oil embargo, if you're like gray hair like me, then you remember going out early in the morning and getting in the line and parking my car at the gas station so I could get gas. That triple gas prices. So here's a 5% drop. Now, current oil depletion, and this is why it's going to affect our business right now. Right now, today, two, a year ago, the International Energy Association, they've been giving us like, oh, everything's fine, don't worry, everything's going to be good. And then two years ago, they said, oh, our new depletion estimates for the world's oil is like 9.1%. And everyone's jaw dropped, and they said, wait a minute, last year you were saying it's 3%, now you're saying it's 9.1%. That means, like, the world's oil fields are dropping at, like, 10% a year. That means we're, like, totally screwed. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, you guys have been telling us all this great news. What, what happened? They said, well, we've been getting together every year, and the best guys in the industry have been giving it our best guess. And last year we did an exhaustive study with numbers and data. <laughs> And imagine that, our numbers triple. Well, if you go and spend tons of money on enhanced oil recovery, well, your depletion rate's only 6.4% a year. Well, 5% drop caused a giant economic crash back in the 70s. And right now, we're looking at, and, and back then, that was an artificial squeeze because the people in Saudi Arabia and, and the Eastern companies Countries said, you know, we don't like what they're doing in Israel, so we're just going to turn the faucet down. But right now, you don't have an artificial squeeze. You've got a real squeeze, and there's no way to get out of it. See, then they just had, back then what they did was drill, baby, drill. Back then, they said, we're going to go, we don't want to be dependent on Arab oil, so we're going to go all over the world, and we're going to drill in Indonesia, and we're going to develop the Cantrell fe giant fields in Mexico, and we're going to develop the North, field, North Slope fields in Alaska. So we had solutions then. We had short-term solutions. Jimmy Carter saw the long-term and said, you know, I'm an engineer, and that's going to be good for a little while. It's not going to be good for long. But he told the American people something they didn't want to hear. What he told them was, this is, a, this is a real problem, and we've got to develop solutions. Well, Ronald Reagan said, no, I don't believe that, Bob. We can just, you know, the world is infinite, and 
we can, our technology guys are going to solve it, and we can do everything. And don't worry about that. We're just going to drill, baby, drill, and we're done. Well, that worked for a while. Okay, this is the, <laughs> this is how they've been doing the predictions, oil predictions. They basically said, whatever we, we're going to have 10% growth per year in the world, and we're going to grow our oil production by 10% a year. And that's been working for the last 100 years, but it's not working anymore. It turns out in the last six months, we had a U.S. military report followed by a German military report followed by the British military report. So even though the government's official thing is that peak oil is a ways out and you don't have to worry, each of the military reports from the major militaries in the world are really are saying, you know, by 2015, we're in serious trouble. You know, and, and the only way we can avoid that trouble is by crashing the economy. And in fact, that's the only reason we... If you look at it, there's sort of a peak point. Like, oil may never be 20 or $30 a gallon. Because when oil got up to $143 a barrel, like two years ago, it crashed the world economy. And it's never come back up to that point again. And every time it starts creeping up over $100 a barrel now, the economy starts tanking again. So oil may never be $20 a barrel, because it may, the economy may never support that. But it may be that the world's economies have totally crashed at whatever price that is. Now, okay, I've said enough about oil. And uh, where are we on time? I'm sorry. Uh, you're just 20 minutes into it. Okay, 20 minutes into it. So let's, we can do this. Okay, the oceans. I'll just skim through each of these other ones. Oil, again, is the one in our face now. But 11 out of 15 of the world's fisheries are either already collapsed or on the verge of collapse. One of the most frightening things is washing up on the shores of, uh, God, I forget, Canary Islands every day now. People go out on the shores and the beaches in the Canary Islands, and you know what they're finding? They're finding dead black men and women floating up on the shores. Healthy, strong, dead black men and women floating up dead. Now, the reason is these people lived off the coast, on the coast of Africa, and they supported their families for generations by fishing the rich fisheries. Now what's happened is, is the fisheries around the Mediterranean Sea, the North Sea fisheries, the Russian fisheries, the Japanese fisheries are all collapsing or collapsed. So the world's mega fisheries, you know, the big factory fisheries on, they're like, they're factories on, on boats. They're going to the other parts of the world and they're scouring the ocean clean of fish. So these people in Africa are starving now, and they're desperate, and they're getting into their 40-foot pierogies, which is like a giant rowboat with a sail, and they're setting sail for Europe, and a lot of them are getting capsized and dying and drowning in the way and washing up on, on the Canary Islands. So that's the future we're looking at if we don't do something different, is a future of desperate people all over the world starving and trying to go somewhere else to make their life work. Now, coral reefs are like the rainforest of the ocean. They stabilize carbon, they take carbon out, and they make, they make uh, calcium and limestone. And the coral reefs eventually become the limestone that we make cement and concrete out of. So they're like stabilizing and part of the carbon oxygen cycle. Well, they're dying. In, uh, they had, I think I'm missing some of that. It looks like it's not quite, let me move it up a little bit. That's not gonna help. Oh, will that not help? No. Oh, you're right, okay. Anyway. Uh, so the coral reefs, there was like 11% that were dying in 2002, and then 2004, then they revised it to 20%. Right now, essentially, we have half of the world's coral reefs already dead or in serious trouble, and another 25% in near-term trouble. So you've got about 75% of the world's coral reefs in, in not that far out potential to collapse. Now, here's a big one is ocean acidification. This is like global warming's evil twin. Now, when when you burn their carbon and, and it goes up in the atmosphere, there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, rain falls and it combines with that and makes carbolic acid. And that comes down, it's called acid rain. Well, the acid rain doesn't just fall on the land, it falls in the oceans too. So that acid coming out, the carbon coming out of the atmosphere and the rain, it goes in the oceans and it's changing the acidification of the oceans. So what's happening in the oceans right now, they're not exactly sure you know, which factors or combination factors are doing it. But a British study showed that 73% of the world's zooplankton has gone away since 19, 
1950, 1960, and half of that since 1990. So what we're doing is, is screwing up the, the balance of the oceans a lot worse than just the fish. We're, we're possibly knocking out the bottom of the food chain in a major part of the carbon oxygen chain. Okay, forests are disappearing. Now, half of the world's forests are gone. Most of that, just like the fish in the ocean, since like 1980. The forests are critical to the water cycle and the weather cycle on our planet. See, each tree, each large tree is supposedly, I've never calculated this out, but uh, supposedly one large tree has the equal equivalent of a 40 acre of lake of evaporative surface area. So what a tree acts like is the roots of a giant tree, whether it's a rainforest tree, whether it's a big redwood, whether it's a, you know, a, a big oak in the east coast, the roots suck up moisture into the branches, it goes out into the leaves, it evaporates, or the needles, evaporates into the air, and this acts like a giant water pump, pumping millions and millions of gallons out of each large tree over its life into the atmosphere, and downstream, downwind, it, it, it makes clouds and it comes down as rain again. So it's a big recycler that pumps the water back in. When you cut down the trees, you have something called desertification happening, and it's not going out to Starbucks and having a nice dessert. Desertification says, like, think of it this way. The Fertile Crescent was the, it's, it's where Iraq and Iran are now, Tigris and Euphrates River. It was like the Garden of Eden 10,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. It was such a perfect climate that humanity and civilization flourished there. And so many people lived there because it was such a great climate and they built agriculture and they, they farmed and they cut all the trees down and they built ships for the Phoenicians. And something called desertification happened when they cut all those trees down and, and plowed all the fields. It started drying up and it became a desert. So now, you know, the Garden of Eden is, is, a, is a desert that uh, has a real hard time supporting people. Now here's the last fact on trees, it's a big one to think about. Deforestation contributes roughly a quarter, it's been calculated to contribute about a quarter of greenhouse gases. So if you add up all the cars, trains, planes, and automobiles in the world, that's about 14-15%. If you add up all the industry, all of the coal mining, all of the processing, all the industry in the world, that's another 14-15%. If you add all the transportation and all the industry together, together, they barely equal, they equal just a little bit more than deforestation in terms of contributing to greenhouse gases and climate change. So it's a bigger deal than we think. We just don't see it because we're not living in the parts of the world where they're going through and just taking all the trees down and shipping them to China to make furniture for the West or cutting them down for burning. You know, we, we don't burn trees, too many trees, in our, uh, you know, to keep us all warm and cook every day. But in parts of the world, the trees are just going away. They're gone. Food crisis. First time since the Green Revolution, we're producing less food every year on the planet, and we've got more and more people. Food riots in 2008 and 2010, straight threatening the stability of many governments. There's a big drought that's hitting both China and India in the breadbaskets. So here's a third, over a third of the population of the world, depending on this food, their breadbaskets are drying up, and the climate is changing. We're, we're having problems. Now, irrigation is 16% of the world's cropland is irrigated, but it's 40% of the world's food. So that's like the Central Valley in California. And most, a large part of the irrigation in the world now is using water unsustainably. Like in China, in India, they drilled a generation ago, they could, in lands that are irrigated, that they're feeding the people in China, in India, with the growing population, a generation ago, they could dip their buckets into the wells with a, you know, with a rope and pull them out. Now they're having to drill in the same place that their fathers or grandfathers dip buckets in by hand. They're going down 5,000 feet with tube wells to get that water. And it's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. They're, the biggest construction project in the world is in China right now. And they're moving a river 800 miles to bring water to Beijing because they've been unsustainably pumping water out of the ground and the aquifer is dying around Beijing and they can't put, they don't have water for the people. So the biggest construction project in the world is to bring a river 800 miles away. Now, population. This is the elephant in the closet. Get this picture in your head. Jesus walked the earth 2,000 years ago. Abraham Lincoln, born just after 1800. In the last decade, 
we've added more people to the population of our world than from the time Jesus was born till Abraham Lincoln was born. And by the end of 20, between the, the beginning of the year 2000 and the end of 2012, we'll have added more people to this planet than the whole world, than the entire population of the world just 200 years ago. So in 12 years, we're adding more people. So when I was a little kid in the 60s, think about it. We'll go back. 10,000 years ago, great flood, some disaster, basically wiped the slate clean. Who knows how many people were on the planet before that? Essentially started. It took about 8,000 years to grow the first half million people. It took another 1,000 years to double that to a billion people. It took 800 years from the year 1,000 to the year 1,800 to double that to get the first billion people in the year 1,800. It took 100 years, 120 years to double that to 2 billion. And then it went from, in 1960, when I was a little kid, to the year 2000. The last doubling happened, and that was 40 years. So we just can't, now we're adding the equivalent. Every 10 years, we, if we keep going like this, we're adding the equivalent of the entire world population 200 years ago, every 10 years. Can't do that. OK, that'd be excuse, whatever. My brain is <laughs> OK. Last thing to bug me out, then we'll start talking about some solutions. So overshoot, what does overshoot mean? Overshoot is when you're consuming the land and the resources faster than they're regenerating. Here's a great example, classic example. Small herd, 29 reindeer introduced to St. Matthew's Island. Now that's a small island off Alaska, between Alaska and Russia, very far north. Now lots of food on the island, no predators, no wolves, nothing there. So this reindeer, 29 reindeer, they went to 1,350 reindeers, and what's that, 13 years. They went from 29 to 1,350. Now, the carrying capacity, that's another term. That basically, from looking at islands like this and other places, they could estimate that the maximum number of, of deer that could sustain itself on that island without, like, overdoing it was about 2,000. Well, the population quadrupled in the next six years to 6,000, so it's, it's exceeded the carrying capacity. This is called overshoot. You know, it's overshot the capacity of the land to support the deer. So they decimated the island. They, they ate everything in sight. The, the soil washed away because there was no you know, lichens and plants holding it there anymore. And the reindeer herd crashed. Most of them starved and died. And they went down to a population of 42 in 1966. So they went from 6,000 deer to 42 in 66. So this is our future if we don't do something different. There's a definition of insanity that says insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Now, we can believe that God is going to bail us out. And we can say God wouldn't let this happen. But God didn't not let the Holocaust and World War II happen. God has not stepped in and not let things happen. We have free will. He gave us free will on this planet. So we keep doing the same thing. We're, our fate is the same as those deer. Now here's this. This is a scientifically calculated biocapacity of the planet. And what this is saying is this, we have one planet. We don't have 1.5 planets. We don't have a half planet. We have one planet. That's how much planets we got. And back here, right around somewhere in the mid-1980s, we started as human beings, started consuming and polluting our planet at roughly the same rate that the planet was able to replenish itself. So since then, now we're in the reindeer situation right here. All of this is reindeer situation. What we're doing is we're consuming the planet faster than it can regenerate. So we're doing what the reindeer's doing. Maybe not as fast. In six years, they collapse themselves. We're not going quite that fast, but we're going the same direction. Now, this is just basically saying, OK, as our population rises, the amount of acres, bioavailable acres per person is dropping because we've got more people on the planet. So right now it says that basically we've got just under two acres per person to support people on the planet. Now, right here in America, we're using nine and a half acres per person. So what we're doing is we'd only need five planet Earths to support everyone in the world the way we live our way right now. Now, if you look at these countries right here, Africa, Asia, you know, if you want to live sustainably, this gives you an idea of what a sustainable level of living. Europe's not sustainable. North America's not sustainable. Anywhere down around here is sustainable. So what's that mean? Latin America's close. 
Asia Pacific and Africa are living kind of within the planet's means right now. Okay, coping with a changing world. It's not, as Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor necessarily the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. So our coming decades will prove if we're responsive to change or not. Now we all buy car insurance, and most of us don't drive down the freeway saying, gee, I want to get into a wreck today. But we buy that insurance, and we hope to God that we never need it. Now, emergency preparedness and preparing for the future changes is a form of insurance. No one can prepare for everything. Obviously, if the world totally collapses, you know, then it won't matter. But we can prepare ourselves to live more sustainably and to weather the storms and hopefully be part of a wave of change that's going to actually change the course to sustainability from collapse. So a few skills, preparation, and planning can bring a great peace of mind. Now, bumps in the road. If we do everything right, we're going to have some real rough times ahead. If we do everything, if we, if we continue going with business as usual, we're going to see the collapse of the financial systems followed by a collapse of pretty much every system that supports life as we know it. And if you're lucky, you'll live in a place where barter and trade and, and local things will, will get you by. And if you're unlucky, well, you know, SOL. <laughs> Old Yankee adage, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. So first, good place to start is a grab and run kit, providing something so that you and your family have, you can throw it in your back if you have to. We're an earthquake country, you can't count on the bridges staying alive. I mean, the bridge is staying up. A major earthquake, if it hit here, all of a sudden your gas would be gone, your electricity would be gone, your potable water would be gone. And uh, now Gary over there makes a great pump that, that works in your well without electricity. So uh, <laughs> I'm just saying some preparations could make a huge difference in short-term problems. Now, long-term problems will take a longer set of preparations. Now, peak one of the long emergency. Now, as I said, I believe, barring like some 2012 apocalyptic pole shift or something, which is anybody's guess, I believe that peak oil will be the first thing that's going to be really in our face that we've got to deal with. And self-reliance is a key. Developing your mental and physical skills now, networking, learning gardening, backcountry, some wilderness skills. Like, like I said, we live in earthquake country. There's a major earthquake fault to the Washoe Valley here. There's a pretty big quake back in the 50s that would be quite devastating right now if it happened today, and we're overdue for one. So hopefully it'll never happen, but you know, it's, a wise man plans ahead and is ready. This is a Chinese saying I started with, I didn't mention it, but it was up on the screen, that is it not too late if one waits until one's thirsty to begin digging a well? So start right now, and start small, and then build up. Gas rationing and shortages. Odd evening rationing back in the 70s could work because we had attendants at all of the gas stations who could tell you whether or not you got gas. Everything now is self-serve, not going to work very well. We were days away from gas rationing after Hurricane Ike about two years back. The, uh, they, were, they, they had calculated, Matt Simmons, who just died, was a advisor to the Bush administration, an oil insider for many years, an oil industry guy, banking guy, money guy, and he calculated on the back of a napkin that if every, that most people looking at receipts at the gas stations, most people in our country now aren't doing that well financially and they're driving with a very small amount of, tank, of gas in their tank. They're filling up five bucks, ten bucks at a time instead of seventy bucks, you know, Phillips. So he calculated that when Ike was striking and the production was down and our reserves were down, that if, if word got out how close we were to being on the edge, that within a day, everyone going out and just filling up their tank within a day would have wiped out every available gallon of gasoline in the southeastern United States. It would have been gone. Every station would have been empty in a day if everyone had talked off their tanks. We were that close. A good hedge against that is plug-in hybrids, motor scooters, electric bicycles, something so that if gas rationing happens, you've got, you've got an energy efficient alternative to an SUV. Now, I live in Truckee, I have an SUV, you know, I'm guilty, I got one, I live in deep snows, but having the option 
so that, you know, if suddenly you just can't get the gas, that that little bit of tank of gas, you get something that can go 200 miles on that gallon. That's really something valuable to have. Or something maybe you get solar cells and a wind turbine, and you can plug it in and recharge off of that, even if the grid's down. That's a really valuable thing to have. Most fuel-injected vehicles can learn to run on ethanol, at least 95% ethanol. And it is possible, there's new technologies coming out to grow, to, to economically make ethanol with lots of different feedstocks. They're not here yet, but there's a great book called Alcohol Can Be a Gas. And again, the technology's not there. Corn ethanol is like a short term. The only good thing about corn ethanol is developing an ethanol infrastructure. But it's not a savior because it, it, it burns almost a gallon of almost a, a gallon of gasoline to make a gallon of corn ethanol. So it's, there's like really no savings in that. Transition communities, how much time we got? Sorry. Uh, you've got about um, eight minutes. Until the hour? Ooh, no. Yeah, eight minutes to, okay. Um, transition communities. These are communities planning for the transition with peak oil, planning for relocalizing, planning for developing transit systems that are not just dependent on the individual automobile. Local energy co-ops, very successful in Europe where you have like a local energy system co-op that gets together and says, we're going to develop biofuels, we're going to develop biomass, we're going to develop wind, we're going to have locally generated power so that if, the, if there is a major grid meltdown, then at least we can start up locally in a small scale. Uh, community ownership, networking, nobody knows it all and has it all. I mean, my book is huge, has a lot of information. I don't know it all, I don't have it all. Nobody knows it all and has it all. Networking community is really the key to living in the future. The lone wolf is going to be pretty isolated and probably someone will come along who's meaner, tougher, and has bigger guns and take it away from them. So the, 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 the real key to getting through the hard times is community and sharing and working together. First aid, self-healing, very important. I'm going to skip through this. We're short on time. Factory, you know, super bugs, factory... Factory farms growing antibiotic-resistant superbugs. These are real. Mariana Britti, beautiful, gorgeous woman, top 10 finalist in Miss World pageant a couple years back. Just gorgeous, Miss Brazil. Gets a urinary infection at Christmas time, goes into the hospital. It's not responding to antibiotics. They ship her to another hospital, the best hospital, you know, best medicine in the world, best antibiotics. Took her down, necrosis, or, you know, she, her hands and feet started dying and going black. They cut them off. And they put her on an iron lung and she died anyways. If she had colloidal silver, which I show you how to make in my book, or some antibiotic resistant herbs, then chances are about, I would give her about a 90% chance, 95% chance she'd be here today. So having blinders on, pharmaceuticals are great when they work, but you know, there's a lot of dang, nasty stuff in the world these days and there's a lot of alternatives. And the pharmaceutical companies aren't making money on the alternatives, so don't let them tell you they don't work. Not everything works every time, but I trust it. Saved my wife's kidneys. She was going down with pharmaceuticals and two thousand dollars and multiple courses of Cipro and every other antibiotic you can think of wasn't working. And five, you know, months of treatment and five days with with home stuff and it was done. Okay. Financial. Here it is. Making the shift. Um, you know, I think you're going to have to talk to me afterwards if we're going to have any time for questions. But the, the key to making the shift to sustainability, number one, is changing our tax structure. Right now, they say, oh, you know, solar, without subsidies, solar won't work. Well, it turns out that we're still, with tax breaks, tax dodges, and those, those lobbyists that have their hands in both the Republicans and the Democrats, we're outspending solar subsidies 10 to 1 by subsidizing fossil fuels to take our planet down. So right now today we're spending $10 for every dollar we subsidize the right way of doing things to make a sustainable future. We're spending $10 making the planet go down, keeping the way we've been doing propped up until it falls on its face. And it will fall on its face. Rebuild our cities and homes. We could put America back to work right now today turning all of our buildings in our cities and our homes into net energy producers instead of consumers. We can put all those out of work electricians, plumbers, and manufacturers back to work building a future. For the money we've spent bailing out Wall Street, 
And unless you're in the upper echelons, you're not going to see any of that. For that money, we could have implemented Plan B. That's more expensive than what we're talking about. We can save the world for less than the Wall Street bailout, but we're not doing it. Rebuild our railways, waterways, mass transit. We've got to have a way of getting off of the individual automobile. I mean, I love my car as much as everybody else, but, you know, a world of 7 billion people and failing, you know, there's ways, there's new technologies. We can make this happen. Rebuild our industries, fund and support renewable energy development, you know, eliminate population growth. We've talked about that before. Share the wealth and the knowledge. The third world wants what we have. We can't say to them, we've sucked all of your resources to support our lifestyle, and you can't have anything. So, and it also, we need to make it viable so that the third world, you know, those people need to eat. They're starving. We must make it economically viable for them to conserve the resources that keep the balance in the world. We must make it. It's our part. We've got to do that. Replace coal burning power plants. Get the new technologies out there. All the technologies already exist or are very short term to do this. It's not like far out. It's not way off. In fact, there's a way right now today you can take coal burning power plants and you can sequester it and make cement out of it. And you actually get carbon negative cement. Right now, making cement is 10% of global greenhouse gases. And there's a new process called Sarah's the company and they have carbon negative cement. In other words, for every pound of cement they make, instead of that 10% of greenhouse gases, they're actually reducing the greenhouse gases in the world. It's there. It's there right now. Global globalization, all decisions based on sustainability. That's the key. It has to become sort of a religion of the world where we say, you know, this is our survival. You know, there is no profit to be made on a dead planet. It just doesn't happen. If we're going to make this happen, it's a new paradigm shift. It's changing the way we think, the way we do business, saying, you know, if it's not sustainable, we're not going to do it. And there's money to be made doing it sustainable. We just, we have to legislate. We have to have the group will to do it. Planet-friendly diet. Um, I've heard from one-fifth to one-third of all greenhouse gases from growing, uh, from basically our farm, factory farming with the animals. You know. And so eating less meat, eating less fish, all of those things help with the planet. Uh, I'm not a strict vegetarian, but it, if you want to make your simplest, easiest way to contribute to the health of the world, it's by being veggie. You know. Buy local. Humans are social animals. I think we're about out of time. And I already mentioned this. Now, here's, here's something food for thought. It took Germany six years to do what the prior administration said it would take America 25 years to do in terms of converting the percent of their contribution of greenhouse gases, getting off of coal and natural gas. In six years, they converted to renewables by the amount that the Bush administration said it would take us 25 years to do. So if Germany can do it, we can do it. And what Germany's doing is they're building on what we started in the Carter years. So they're doing that. Can we do this now? Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt went to Detroit and said, you know, guys, you've got to be 100% behind the war effort. This is a do-or-die situation. If we don't change it, we're, you know, our way of life is over. You know, we're going to be speaking German. And he said, within a year, I don't want anyone to be making a single vehicle for domestic use in America. And they, pro they made these projections and targets that they thought were unachievable. Well, six months later, Detroit was 100% switched over. And within a year, they not only did they meet those targets, they met every one of the targets, and in some cases, far exceeded those targets. So that's the kind of effort. If we're going to change the world, that's the kind of effort we need. So we can do this. Now think about it. Some say, People can't change. Well, we never would have defeated Hitler if it was 10 on the world's priority list. And if, if you say people can't change, think about it. How many cannibals do you personally know? Anybody know cannibal? No. Okay. How many people do you know are slave owners? No. Okay. How many people? That, that proves it. We can change. You know, it does happen. Now, one-sixth of the world's military budget, it's been estimated, would make the difference in implementing the shift to sustainability. 
So we can't take a sixth of our annual military budget in the world and, and turn that into making this shift happen. Then we deserve to collapse and we deserve to die. Now, why I wrote When Technology Fails. People say, what's an engineer, MIT engineer, doing writing about the failure of technology? Well, I've had a, at the time, in 1997, Thanksgiving roughly, give or take a few days, I'd had a 20-year practice of prayer and meditation. Now it's 30 years. And I just made a generic request for guidance and inspiration. And I got this bomb dropped in my lap. I got like a 30-page pictorial, three-dimensional storyboard outline for what became my book, When Technology Fails, dumped into my head. Now, believe me, I am not that smart. A term paper in college was a major ordeal. This is like 90 term papers in one. So my first thought was, I can't do this. This is way too much. I don't know all of this stuff. And a little voice in my head said, nobody knows it. And it assured me that I could do this if I took it on. Now, saving the world, it's like no one person is going to do it. But each and every one of us can be part of making shift happen, part of making the change in the planet. There's a huge wave going on right now. There's something like this two million independent organizations in the world de de devoted to making shift happen, to social and ecological change in the planet. So what's happening is, is people all over the world are getting it, that our world is in trouble, and we've got to change the way we did it. The way we did business in a world that had a, mil a billion people on it is not the way we can continue to do business in a world that we're coming up on 7 billion by the end of this year now. And they're projecting 9 billion, 10 billion in another 50 years. I personally don't think we'll ever get there. That we'll either stop it on purpose or Mother Nature will stop it through collapse. So the choices are. So anyway, I think you're probably going to have to ask me questions outside. Am I out of time? I'm assuming I'm out of time. And uh, thank you for listening to me. I hope I haven't bummed you out too much. And I hope that I've inspired you. And here's my motto. My motto is do your best to change the world and do your best to be ready for the changes in the world.